we are uh, world seas apart, uh, but probably much closer in many other aspects. Uh, you and I share God knows how many wonderful people, connections in, in common. And um, you have written a book with a wonderful company called Page Two. I, I don't know how many Page Two authors I've actually had, but it seems they always hit rock and roll. Great, great people. In your own words, Oscar Tromboli, who are you? I think to understand me, you have to go into a boardroom in April of 2008. And it's between a video conference between Sydney, Seattle and Singapore. And it's the ultimate arm wrestle. It's the annual budget setting process between a subsidiary organization, Australia, and regional and global representatives from Singapore and Seattle. And if you can imagine a bank of spreadsheet jockeys sitting behind all of us trying to crunch numbers as we talk. And these meetings are renowned for going well over the allotted 90 minutes, but they're called budget setting meetings. You need to set the budget or you can't leave. And at the 20 minute mark, my vice president in the room, Tracy, looks me straight in the eye and says, Oscar, I need to see you immediately after this meeting. Now, Minta, I did not listen to another thing for the rest of that meeting mm. because all I was writing down was, how many weeks of salary have I got left? What are my big expenses? Negotiation. Because Tr Tracy would never say that to me and I'm, I'm about to get fired. Now, miraculously, the meeting finished early. They finished at the 70 minute mark uh, with everything resolved, which was unusual. Because I wasn't paying attention, I got a huge uplift in my budget. But that's a story for another day. Tracy asked me to close the door as everybody filed out and all the spreadsheet jockeys also left. And as I walked back towards her, she said, you have no idea what you did at the 20 minute mark, do you? And I thought, I'm getting fired and I don't even know why. As I sat down in front of her, she said, if you could code the way you listen, you could change the world. And the only thing going through my head had nothing to do with what Tracy said. It was, woohoo, I haven't been fired <laughs> and I live to fight another day. I and and uh, how would I describe myself as a listener is how I would describe myself. And to what extent have you carried the conversation on with Tracy? Well, let's wind the clock forward a month later. We're, we're now in May of, 20, of uh, 2018 and uh, we have the subsidiary budget setting meeting and we have the local CFO, Brian, who says to me, Oscar, I want you to come to our budget setting meeting because I want you to audit my listening. I said, oh, Brian, you've been talking to Tracy about that listening malarkey. And he goes... Look, Oscar, I know you got a really big uplift in your budget. Now, typically, the budget area I looked after, Minta, was growing at about 10%, 12%. Because I wasn't paying attention, 32% uplift. And Brian said to me, I can't fix your top line, but we can invest for growth. Uh, and uh, would you be interested? And I said, Brian, what time's the meeting and where is it? And I, like a rat up a drain pipe, I was at Brian's meeting. And I sat there and I started to audit how he listened and thanks to Tracy, who's traveled to New York and uh, part of global roles looking after Rupert Murdoch's property empires. And uh, she's recently got a, a role back in Australia on one of the big boards of one of the retailers here. And I have enormous gratitude for Tracy because everybody would have experienced how I listened. It was her in her insightful, careful, considered and reflective way that she took the time to share that gift with me. And I've been trying to code how to listen uh, for the rest of my life for the last uh, decade and a half. Well, at this point, Oscar, it does feel like we are at a crossroads or at least some uh, fork together in the road. The idea of coding listening really that was certainly one of the questions I wanted to talk to you about, but I, on the other side, have been thinking about encoding empathy, but literally mm. into machines and coding, listening, what you're 
I mean, I assume more thinking about is, is looking at the concepts that go into making us human beings learn better as opposed to thinking of us as machines. Yeah, that back in the meeting room where the budget was set the first time, the only thing I was able to blurt out, apart from in my head, I'm going, woohoo, I haven't been fired. What I actually said out aloud, and this is a lesson for everybody because what people are thinking and what they're saying can be two different things. So in my head, I'm going, woohoo, I haven't been fired. What I said to Tracy in that moment was, Tracy, do you mean code or code code? And she said, Oscar, we work at Microsoft. I mean code software. And in my head, like I could not make sense of that. I thought, yes, a methodology, a prescription, a, a sequential way of approaching it. I didn't imagine that it could be coded. Now, for the last decade and a half, I, I have been, as my wife would say, absolutely obsessed with listening. And we've researched 26,000 workplace listeners to try and understand what the code is. Uh, the good news and the bad news, because I come from a software background, I realized that the models that sit behind the things you're describing, coding, empathy, need to be valid, and they need to be repeatable. Those things are easy to say, but they're very difficult to do without a very substantial data set. So I've worked with market research companies as we go through the validation um, process and saying code listening, saying code empathy is very easy to say it's extraordinarily difficult to do. And it's become cheaper because technology like this is more accessible than ever. Yet there are enormous ethics that I'm conscious of when it comes to coding anything. There's a lot of unconscious bias that gets coded <laughs> into everything from your insurance premium uh, to uh, your loyalty card at your supermarket. So coding anything, I, I, I take as a huge responsibility. So we, we, what have we coded so far? We've, we've coded three books. We've coded a set of playing cards. We've coded a listening quiz to try and capture this kind of information. But we haven't gone the other way and said, if this, then that. If this, then that. If this, then that. AI. And I and, and, and that possibly is, is, is the next step in the journey. I did enjoy a couple of the previous conversations you've had, um, particularly with Jeremy from the Watson team at IBM and well worth a listen where he makes three distinctions between the three types of IA, general AI, and uh, the AI that everybody talks about and that. I think as humans, we need to evolve the way we think about our interaction with technology. And I always say, beware of people bringing false binaries. It's AI or it's humans as opposed to AI and humans. And how can they each augment each other? How can they make each other better? Yeah, I think we're, intelligence. we're only at the early, early stages of this well, it's, I mean, outside of the agreement on that, we're, I still feel we're at the early stages of understanding what's going on in our brain. Hmm. Uh, and until we get a grip on that, how on earth do we replicate it? And without that consciousness to understand the unintended consequences when you code and scale something, where you distribute that to everybody who's got a smartphone, where you distribute that to anybody who's got access to a smart device, whether that's a speaker in their home or a speaker in their car, there are unintended consequences. Uh, bad actors will, will use that technology for their own ends. They will use that to separate humanity from each other rather than bring humanity together. So we need to be cautious, deliberate, thoughtful. 
as we move forward. We have opened the box. Now as humans, we have a choice. What do we do with it? Yeah, and Microsoft is uh, in the middle of all that, A, open AI. So empathy is, is sort of my gig, listening is yours. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what is the distinction in your mind? How do you lay them out differently? What is their relationship? Not, not being an expert in the field of empathy, I will defer to you for your definition. I'll be very clear when I talk about listening myself. There's two types of listening. There's listening to what's said, and then there's noticing what is not said. And my speculation is that how you would refer to empathy sits in that gray zone between what's said and what's not said is is my speculation so for me when i talk to people about listening is most people will focus on what's said and engage with that the, the kind of listening i'm talking about is the noticing of what's absent from the dialogue what has not been said what has still to be thought through and what is meant by what that person is trying to go into a dialogue with you about so where does empathy intersect with that? You may have to tell me. Well, no, surely it's a an exchange. And the the notions that you talk about in the book, which is called How to Listen, you you obviously talk about uh, well the nonverbal cues and, and everything else that's around it. And there's the words that are coming out, but then there are all the emotions being expressed and how much when you communicate that happens through the eyes which was one of the pieces that i really enjoyed a lot and ultimately listening active listening in particular is a is the sort of the linchpin of empathy and there's a another element to it which is interesting which where you talk about you know this uh, i think would um, self-awareness bias in mm. In the way people understand they are good listeners and the way they are perceived as good listeners is quite a an ocean or two apart. I think something like 75% think they have above average listening skills and and people only think that 12% of people have above average, if I can remember correctly. Yeah, great pretension. Well done. Similarly, in empathy, uh, I have done a research online and it was about 1,200 people, something like that exactly the same percentage believe that they have an above average empathy. And, and I don't have the reverse as in how many people think that other people are above average, mm. but basically the law of mathematics would suggest that 75% above average is mathematically improbable. And therefore just by that virtue, they have an overestimation of their abilities. So, Tell us about that sort of self-awareness bias, because I thought that was, I think it's a really relevant piece in today's world, our, our lack of self-awareness and this notion of bias. We were very deliberate in our, in our research to make sure we understood that Listening is a simultaneous equation, meaning your roles change through the dialogue. You could be a speaker in one second and a, and a listener in the other. And we wanted to ensure that when we were researching this and our research team got absolutely barking frustrated with Oscar because I'm continuously asking, well, what will be the opposite of that? And this is a, a really simple technique to uncover what's, what's your own bias because I'm not immune to being biased myself, but I'm conscious enough to use techniques that will quickly surface where my unconscious bias may be. When we play in the dialogue, there are these two parts, and we wanted to make sure we ask the person who was self-assessing themselves as a listener, we ask them how they rate themselves. 
we asked them to describe when they were listening well what was present. And then we asked them the opposite question. When you're a speaker, what frustrates you about the other person? And what was interesting mathematically in the data, now all of these were verbatim responses, meaning they typed them in, in long form. When they describe themselves as good listeners, their responses on average were 60% shorter than when they described a poor listener. They could write a lot of information about the characteristics of a poor listener, yet they could not write the same when it came to the character characteristics of a good listener. And that made me curious. It's like, hmm, I wasn't paying attention to the content. What, what were they typing in? I was just looking mathematically. Wow, there's a big disconnect here between how people describe themselves in the state of good versus the state of poor. Hmm, I wonder what that could be telling me. And then, and then Harvard's done a wonderful piece of research around unconscious bias. They, they've researched, I think it's over 20 million people have now taken the un unconscious bias, or what they call it association, unconscious associations where you're, you're asked a sequence of alternatives and you get a outcome there. And what's interesting about the Harvard assessment is it gives you a couple of prescriptions to think about. For each of us, it's difficult to be conscious enough to go, oh, a bias may be present in a conversation. When the dialogue is simple, when the dialogue is with someone you trust and where the dialogue doesn't have significant risk or significant emotion, good or bad, the bias is easy to spot. It's easy to be self-conscious in those conversations. Yet when there's something at risk, when there's something of high emotion, it all goes out the window. And back to what you mentioned earlier on, we don't fully understand how the brain works, but something goes back into the primal part of our being. I mean, and yeah. yeah, all these linguistic things that we talk about and lovely ways to have productive dialogue, they go out the window because we go into some kind of fight or flight or reaction mode. And I'm not going to be here saying to you, Hey, Minta, <laughs> it's easy to be conscious enough to notice your unconscious bias. It, it, it is in predictable conversations for sure. But the conversations that are memorable, that matter, that matter decades down the track, that they're the tough ones. I don't have an answer for those ones. Right. So a lot of things. I'm... Um... When I think of encoding it now, this time in the machine, to try to replicate and improve perhaps uh, listening skills, and therefore presumably wish to eliminate all biases, I think of the role of journalists who are supposed to report objectively. I, I don't actually know any person that doesn't have a bias. I'm going to give you an example, Oscar, to be easy. So hmm. unpolitically correct. My family, I prefer them over yours. Sorry. My rugby team over your rugby team. My, my society over your society. All right. Now that gets dangerous because that sounds like it's some form of racism quickly. But at the end of the day, is it not the human condition to actually have bias? And is it appropriate to completely sanitize all bias? out of everything. Ironically, I was asked this question by a journalist and I said, to be human is to be biased. And they were speculating what you just mentioned that you should decompose and deconstruct and analyze and remove bias. Great, leave that to a machine. 
a human has emotion present in every single syllable, in every single sentence, in every single thought. Before every and to thought. Take, yeah, and to take that away is a fairly fundamental question about what it means to be human. I talk about bias questions versus neutral questions as a subset of what we're talking about. And bias questions typically have more than eight words and neutral questions, open questions typically have less. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, it's really important to ask open questions. I can go, not always. Bias questions play a very important role, particularly in business or when you're making decisions, when you're allocating resources, when something has to be decided in a time frame. So bias questions are not good or bad. You just have to choose when are they going to be productive. And I think back to your original question, the same is true in any human dialogue. It's like just by the nature of your humanity, you're going to have bias. You're going to have bias based on, like I won the genetic lottery where I was born, the son of two first-generation migrants from Italy after the war. Yet where I was born meant I have enormous educational privilege. I have enormous financial privileges. I have enormous climate privilege. There are so many things that I'm biased because of where I was born. Then I was biased because of how I was educated. Then I was biased because of the workplaces I grew through. To deny that would be to deny my life experience. I biased think, on how you dealt with shit. And I think it takes a maturity to declare the bias and go, look, I'm going to hold that to be true for me. You can do with it what you choose. But in this moment, in this dialogue, this is my truth. This is my lived experience. You can accept it. You can reject it. You can do with it what you choose. I, I'm okay with that. I think it's where the dialogue degenerates into oh well you know you can't say that but i just have <laughs> you can't think that well i just have i you can't choose that option well i just have and i think the beautiful thing happens in the disagreement that's the bit we want to dialogue through not just to go oh well we, we can't talk about that anymore that's where empathy and listening is present when we know there's a clash of ideas. And I think it takes enormous maturity and courage to stay in that place that's uncomfortable because amazing things emerge when you sit there. You know, gold is made through fire. And that can be made into jewelry, that can be made into CPU chips and computers. There's all kinds of things you can do, but gold has to go through your fire. And I think a relationship needs to go through that fire as well in a dialogue for it to strengthen. We need to be careful about putting all these seat belts and safety blankets around dialogues because we we may be trading off something really important in the tension, in the disagreement. Well, I mean, actually, I mean, I so seatbelts in cars are pretty in favor of, but the the sort of Gestapo seatbelts has sort of moved into so many different areas where the principle of precaution and safetyism, to use John Haight's words, has has seeped in and so everything is becoming sanitized and it feels like those who are in the empathy bandwagon or the 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 listening bandwagon in general are all about trying to make a better world but they gloss over this hard part which is that that grisly band of brothers listening where you go through shit including perhaps loss including struggles, disagreement, argument, maybe even a fight. And if you can get through that, then you are far more solid as a unit, as a team, as a couple, whatever, uh, if you know how to get through that. Because until you've tested that, 
it's superficial shit. And I think empathy is the other side of a disagreement. Never heard it expressed that way. I'll have to ponder that and mull it over in my sleep because your morning, my night, that's what I'll be doing next. So um, <laughs> for, the, for those of you who couldn't see Minter in that moment, his eyes went to a completely different place. Indeed. When I said, were... em empathy is the other side of a disagreement and that has changed his state. And if it was my conversation, we'd go into a completely different place, but it's not. So I'll you're going to run down continue. that rabbit hole, would you? I, I do want to uh, talk about eyes. Mm -hmm. So when you speak to somebody and, and uh, you look in their eyes deeply over seven seconds or 10 seconds, I can't remember the, the exact number. It's too much. And if, it's, uh, if you're looking up before you speak, you're looking, searching for an idea. If you're looking down, you're sort of embarrassed or all these different signals that the eyes do. And you, you, you cited um, uh, an article, which I really enjoyed, uh, by Sue Schellenberger, Just Look Me in the Eye Already, which was published in, in Quantified Communications, and this notion of how, how much should we look in the eyes. So, But it didn't touch on something that I thought was, for me, patently obvious, which is that, in my observation, and caution, this is a possibly sexist term, but women seem to look in the eyes a lot more, a lot more deeply than men. And therefore, I tend to believe that women listen better. Well, there's two different things there, so I'm going to pull both of them apart. I want to, I always say to people, uh, know the boundary conditions of any statement you're going to make. And... Uh, cultures interpret eye contact very differently. So we're, sure. we're going to talk about it through Western, probably English speaking context where eye contact and depth or time with direct eye contact is relevant because Fair point. in, in the cultures, high context cultures, particularly Korean, Asian, uh, sorry, Korean, Chinese, um, the indigenous communities, the Maori communities, the Eskimo communities, eye contact means something completely different when it's over an extended period of time. And it's very contextual to who's making the eye contact, particularly in, in seniority. But back to the point, I, I uh, interviewed a parenting expert because everybody wanted me to ask the question, how do you get kids to listen to you? And Dr. Justin Coulson has written eight books, many PhDs. I think he's done three. And that doesn't matter for a hill of beans. He has got seven children <laughs> and seven girls. That makes him a parenting expert, not everything else. But, but he made a really interesting point. He said with teenagers, particularly when it comes to eye contact, if you're wanting to discuss something important, with a teenage girl, take her out for a milkshake, a coffee, a cup of tea, sit there face to face, look them directly in the eye. With a teenage boy, take them fishing, go on a bike ride, do gardening together, go on a car ride, but don't have direct eye contact because the teenage boy will code that as aggression and a threat. So you won't get the same kind of conversation from them. So eye, eye contact matters, but be cautious. When we interviewed Susan Constantine, the human lie detector, she, she's coded a lot of Ekman's work, who's the original expert in the field, into software. And she says most people get those heuristics wrong, you know, looking up, looking down, et cetera. She would say, unless you've studied in the field, just notice when it changes dramatically in their body, which is what happened to you when I made that comment earlier on. The, the, the eyes will move, in a, and so will the head, by the way, move in a completely different direction, and you'll notice the energy change. Now, I don't want to disappoint you, Minta, but I've studied a lot around listening and listening research, and it's very difficult to find any statistical difference in listening effectiveness between the genders. It's very marginal. 
Yet what is commented on is that men and women listen very differently. They have a very different starting point. And I'm going to make it really superficial. Men listen to fix, women listen to feel. That's roughly what the research tells us. And I think your interpretation of women are better listeners than men probably relates to a bias you hold around empathy. Yeah, women will listen in a more empathetic way than men will listen. Men will listen for outcome and progress and women will listen into the context and the relationship. They, they will be happy to sit there for a while. I don't think it makes either kind of listening more or less valuable. But for the speaker, you also need to be conscious, how do you want the other person to listen to you? And if you don't ask that question, sometimes you may be surprised. I, I had a client who I walked in, I've been working with for a long time. And she said to me, Oscar, put your hazmat suit on. This was pre-COVID. I need to vomit. I don't want you to say anything till I finish my vomit. I went, okay. And for the next 29 minutes in a 90 minute meeting, she literally got everything that was really frustrating to her out of her system. And I keep looking at my watch going, I haven't said a word for 10 minutes, for 12 minutes, for 18 minutes. She said at the end of that time, she says, wow, I've never said half that stuff. Now, if I didn't ask the, if she didn't make the statement at the beginning that she just wants to vomit on me, <laughs> I would have listened in a completely different way. So there's a dual responsibility there. There's a responsibility on the speaker as much as the listener for setting up the conversation for great success. So back to the question, eyes matter, sure, when they completely change position. Uh, women value the intimacy of, of the direct eye contact. And I'm very conscious of, of that myself in, in my work in one-on-one in -on -one settings. Uh, one thing I'm very deliberate about is making sure my head height is at their head height. I'm probably shorter than most men. So that kind of puts me at a disadvantage sometimes. And the other thing I'm very conscious of is their back is always closest to the exit. And I am always sitting farthest from the exit in a meeting room as an example. So that's the extent to which sometimes you've got to think through how you're setting up the conversation for success there. Now, I'm curious, back to your original proposition, what are you taking out of those two things about eye contact and gender listening? Well, I absolutely believe that the, I've always described intelligence as making sense. And the, the concept there is making sense of what you hear but also allowing others to make sense of what you say. And, and if you can't describe what you're saying in a way that's digestible, understandable by the person, persons to whom you're speaking, then you're the idiot in that particular regard. And you need to change your communication styles according to the people. So like you have in your book, this example of the person who bends down and talks to the child eye to eye, and making that effort and, and figuring out how it may be. Well, I, when I do talks to, let's say I, I've done talks to 60, 100 uh, boys and girls in uh, who are eight years old, how do I talk to them? Well, it's different than when I talk to a bunch that are 12 to 13, which is different from 15 to 16, which is different from 22 to 24, which is also different from 80 to 85 as, as, as I have. And, and, and so it's, it behooves the speaker's ability to speak. And I haven't really thought about the contract idea that you mentioned, and I certainly hadn't thought about the exit idea, but I, I tend to be focused on the listening side. And in my data points, uh, there's lots of research that shows to the extent that it's measurable that women score 10 percentage points higher than men on average on empathy. And an interesting you know, corollary to this is there's empathy that I try to do and there's empathy that's received. So you, you might try to listen, but the other person doesn't believe you are. And, 
And sometimes ne'er the two shall cross because no matter how well I think I'm listening, there can be the bias of the listener who just doesn't want to believe that you possibly, Mr. Tromboli, you're an Italiano, you can't possibly understand me. I'm, you know, I'm Japanese or I'm something else. And therefore, it doesn't matter how well you think you're listening, I still will refuse to believe that you're listening to me. It was a, a wonderful review that was posted about the book. And I think it applies to empathy as much as it does to listening. And it said, like comedy and sex, we all think we're better at it than we actually are. And I think the the point I took out of that was the value of comedy, sex and listening and empathy sits with the other, yet it's only co-created. It can't exist in isolation. And we say that great listeners change the way the speaker communicates their idea, which is back to your point about if the speaker doesn't take responsibility for enunciating this in a meaningful, useful, productive way that the listener can catch it, this is not going to make much progress. And often I'm asked this question, Oscar, you know, I struggle listening to somebody that rambles on they get repetitive and I don't want to interrupt them, but it's not going anywhere. <clears throat> One of the fallacies of listening and probably true with empathy as well is that all listening or all empathy interruption is bad. It's not. A skillful, professional, thoughtful and subtle interruption will help the speaker say their idea a little differently because the speaker is thinking nearly nine times faster than they can speak. So they have such a jumble in their head. It's like a clothes washing machine on rinse and wash cycle. It's just sudsy, it's dirty, it's agitated, it's moving around. And when they speak, it's their rinse cycle. And, and often I will say to people, just say to them, a version of this, make it some kind of personal interpretation. But I, I would often say, oh, wow, Minta, that's fascinating. If that was a subject line in an email and all of a sudden the speaker shortens, distills and synthesizes what they're trying to say and what you've helped them to do is to listen to how they think, not just to what they say. Or... I often will say, if that's not appropriate, just say, if we were going to summarize this conversation in a breath for our manager, how would we say it? And they go, oh, it would be blah, blah, blah. And they go, oh, never thought of it that way. Because up until that point, they hadn't actually thought about shortening it and synthesizing it. So there is a responsibility on the listener if the speaker's stuck to help them dialogue in a different way because not everybody has been trained as well as you have in storytelling <laughs> not everybody understands the components of how to communicate an idea with impact and that's the role of the listening person in the conversation as well as the empathetic person in the conversation too you're vomit uh, woman, the diatribe, 29 mm. minutes. It made me think that that is not a really effective way of communicating because the possibility of you retaining uh, even 4% of the 29 minutes of rolled on continuous ma material without any time for you to break, ask questions and clarify, take a breath and <laughs> take notes is, is also a uh, a mistake and and when you listen well and you interrupt somebody and i like the idea this idea of the mechanic of using a third party to like the email or the boss so it's like i didn't get what you said can you just wrap it up that might make them feel defensive but if you sort of position it in another way but yeah. the art of reformulating which you talk about a lot and it's something i'm i i just was on a podcast and i just and and she asked me what would you what's the one thing you'd like to work on i said I think I need to reformulate better. It's a tremendous talent to reformulate 
It shows great presence and agility of mind because you're not just going to regurgitate the exact words. You're going to reformulate it in a way that changes it enough to spark the, oh, that's right. That's exactly what I mean. Or, uh uh-uh, let me reformulate it. Mm. And reformulate with permission. I think sometimes we're reformulating for our own purposes rather than right. their purpose or, or the dialogue. Or well, one thing I often say to people, number one, when it comes to listening, it's not your job to make sense of what they're saying. And we'll pull that apart shortly. Please. It's your job to help the speaker make sense of what they think and what they mean first. Otherwise, you're dealing with the wrong conversation. If you're just dealing with the first 125 words they say, you're dealing with you're dealing with a draft email. You're dealing with the very first thing that comes out of their mouth. The other thing is in that 20 minute format, my job wasn't there to listen, retain, make sense or any of that. She gave me complete permission to do that. What was I doing in that 29 minutes? I was listening for repetition, which was absent. So everything she said was completely different. She wasn't going around in a circle on a particular issue. There wasn't a particular thing that she was getting worked up about. The other thing I was listening for were absolutes, always, never, precisely, because they are code words to something that maybe they need to go and explore a little bit more. And so in that 29 minutes, I was relaxed. I was detached because my job in that moment wasn't to listen to what she said or what I thought. My job was to understand, is the dialogue progressing? And most of us don't realize there's the third person in the dance or the dance, depending on which part of the world you're from. And the third person is the conversation. And too much of us focus our attention on us or them and don't notice the third place is the conversation progressing. When we do that, we adopt a very different listening orientation. Our questions come from a very different place. Thus, the third person that we mentioned earlier on, how would we say this to a manager? It's a simple way to summarize. When we go, our job is not to make sense of what they say the first time, but to help them think and mean. Now, listening in the workplace, that's my field of endeavor, is not therapy. So please don't confuse this with therapy. Therapy is therapy. This is not therapy. We are trying to make commercial progress. And to do that, we need to focus on the conversation as the center of the dialogue, not the two participants. Because when we do, we'll get stuck we'll get the speaker who's rep- repeating. Ah, oh, they never listened to me. I tried this three years ago. And when I tried, blah, 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 blah. That, that, that's handy, but it's not productive. So when, I, when we talk about listening in this context, the way we describe it, we want people to listen to what's not said because their meetings are shorter but they're more meaningful and there's much more rapport because the speaker feels heard, seen and valued rather than just say the very first thing that comes out of their mouth. Now, again, you've had that shift in body position. So I'm curious what's going on for you as I kind of change the way you thought about listening. Well, I was just, uh, you know, you can't help having motor mind, uh, even mm. as listening and, and, and zoned in as I might be, because you you sparked off this, you know, rabbit hole, almost psychedelic, which is the uh, the notion of us, the the conversation, the the thing that is above us, you and me, and and having that BDI on the meta level that's happening. How do you instill that? Is that something that you can teach or does it have to be learned? What I'm about to say next is very simple to say. It's difficult to practice. I want a hat tip to Emma, one of my clients in the UK who works in recruitment and has made this phrase famous with her clients in the biotech industry. 
And when we work with our clients, we, we say to them one thing, forget everything you've ever learned about listening and just do this one thing either before the meeting commences or at the very beginning of the meeting. This should be the very first question you ask. And this question is like a listening compass. It will help you in the dialogue hold this position above the conversation. It will tell you whether the questions you ask are north-south questions, which means we're heading in the same direction, let's keep going, or east-west questions, let's listen differently. And the question is really simple. And it should be asked roughly every 25% in the meeting. And the question is this, what would make this a great conversation? Now, an important distinction, do not say what would make this a great conversation for you? Yeah, because they will tell you in very minute detail what will make it a great conversation for them because you're talking about their favorite topic with them. But this is holding the position above that. Now, what happens is imagine where we're in a one hour meeting or a 50 minute meeting, every 15 minutes, simply say, hey, Minta, at the beginning, you said this would make it a good conversation. How are we going? And what Emma says, and to her surprise as she did this, she says, Oscar, if I'm listening well, the meeting's over at the 15 minute mark. And then they start to tell me other stuff. Or they tell me, look, we've done this bit well, but can we do this bit next, right? Which they would never talk about. That little question, what will make this a great conversation? Check in every 25% in a meeting and you'll find that your meetings are shorter. At least that's what our research group tells us that we're tracking. This question will do that. Is it an easy question? Yes. The discipline of asking every 15 minutes, that's the hard bit. But when you build that muscle, meetings are shorter, rapport is higher because the other person feels hurt. And to bring it home, Emma, Emma says, when I get referred by my clients to other potential clients now, the way they refer Emma is, you can get any recruiter, but Emma will actually listen to you. Mm. Uh, so a little bit of me did a, a, a dance of joy. So, so can that be taught? Absolutely. That, 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 our, our deep listening ambassador community has taken that idea out into the world and brought back the evidence of progress. It takes a good deal of discipline and courage. And, and sometimes it can simply be an email before the meeting. It doesn't have to be right at the beginning of the meeting as well. The final part of that bit, Minta, is that when you play back what they said at the beginning of the meeting at the 15 minute mark, what happens for the speaker is, wow, he's actually listened to what I said, which is surprisingly rare for most people. And you increase rapport as a result. Easy to say, difficult to practice. 90 days to 120 days, our ambassador community have kind of said that's how long it takes them to build that muscle. And in group meetings, you should ask that question as the host. And if the host doesn't ask the question as a participant, you should ask the host that question as well. Nice. So um, we're drawing to a close uh, and I still feel like I have another zillion questions, but let me sort of zero in on this idea of that question, which is, you know, how, how do we, what, what does a good conversation look like? You talk a lot about deep listening. I tend to talk a lot about deep conversations. Mm. And if the answer to that question, a good conversation, looks like, well, we resolve our issue. Right? We resolve our issue. It's us. But it doesn't sound particularly profound. And uh, I'm wondering where the, what the link is between deep listening and deep conversation in Oscar's mind. So we talk about the concept of the listening battery. 
and, and a lot of us turn up to conversations with our listening battery at orange or red or just about to touch black. So you can't always have a deep listening conversation. Please be aware of that. And sometimes you have to go, look, now's not a good time for that conversation. Can we do it another time? So that, that's the first thing I would say. Be deliberate. Not all conversations for me are deep listening conversations. Uh, <laughs> when I'm listening to my two brother-in-laws bang on about religion at lunchtime on a Sunday, again, I'm complete, <laughs> a completely disconnected. Now they're banging on about the religion of Canon versus Nikon when it comes to photography. So I, I was like, my f camera is my phone, right? Am I deeply listening in that conversation? No, I'm, I'm skating over the top of it because that's the contract. They, they're going to talk about their phone thing, uh, their camera thing, and I, 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 I'm going to kind of skate across the top. If a staff member's come to me with a significant issue, uh, I want to make sure that I, let's pick the time for that. And can it be resolved in one conversation? Hmm, not sure. Be cautious. Be careful, be deliberate. It, it may take three or four conversations. And again, in high context cultures where they value the relationship over the outcome, they're very good at this. They're very good at taking their time to go through and fully understand the backstory before they get to the dialogue about what can we discuss, before they get to the dialogue about what are the alternatives, before they get to the dialogue about what their agreements are. In the West, we try and put them all into one conversation in 30 minutes or less. Uh, that would be a good outcome. Um, look, if it's a significant thing requiring deep conversation, it may take place over an extended period of time. But again, discuss that up front. Do both parties feel can be resolved in this conversation or are we okay splitting it over conversations? Where we don't do a lot of good work in the West is we don't discuss how we're going to discuss it before we get into the content. We get straight into the what and we forget about how. We get into content before we think about process. If we just spent a little bit more time talking about how long we think this would take, maybe we can have deep conversations that make progress. It might take a couple of goes at it to get there. If it is deep, I speculated something has probably been hanging around for a while, so it does need a little bit of time. What do you think, Minta? Well, on the... Uh... On the West East story, I first of all I was really intrigued by your compass uh, notion. I, I, I carry a compass in front of me. I talk about the North all the time, and uh, so the idea of, of um, when differently is the East West as opposed to direction, um, mm. North North South. Yeah, questions was, have energy and direction, so be cautious which direction you're going to choose for that question. So I'll give you two quick examples. Tell me more. That's a north-south question. That's going to keep the conversation in the same direction. East-west, and what else? What else have you That's explored? What else oh, have yeah. you considered? Well, you know, tell it, me it, more. It sounds similar. As, and what else? It could be similar. It, it could be, but it is unlikely in the context of the dialogue. Abstracted where we are here now, where we're just looking at a, at a listening compass, but in the context of a conversation, Wow, tell me more about that. So I wanted to dial into this time component. So obviously cultures have different mm -hmm. notions of time. And it's been my observation that if you constrain with time a meeting or a conversation, the, there's a greater chance that we will be more about delivering the narrative that we want to deliver as opposed to giving the time for the listening that's necessary for that connection to happen. The mutual sharing of ideas, mutual listening of ideas and if we are said, well, we've got to speak within 50 minutes and make a really interesting conversation. We will have a conversation. We might even have a successful conversation, but it's unlikely to move the dials sufficiently because we haven't really listened in to one another.
When I spoke to to Tom Varghese, who who studies across cultures, he talks about this concept of time, and he, he was, we were talking about Indian culture, which he calls polychronic, which means that their relationship with time is very different to someone who's on Greenwich Mean Time or, or British Standard Time. And uh, if New the York meetings minute. to start, yeah, if the meetings to start at the top of the hour, that that's a good indication in India, but it doesn't mean everybody's going to be in the room at the top of the hour. And and Westerners who who go to India and are frustrated by that will will quickly learn that time has a very different orientation. Uh, working with my clients, they are thinking about time in a way that is sequential. Yet what they're doing in that sequence is forcing dialogue into a time period that means they're not allowing the idea to fully expand. I talk about the analogy of making bread. And when we think about kneading time, time is the yeast for the idea. And when you make bread without yeast, it's flat, it's untasty. Nobody's really going to talk about it. But when you give it time to rise and prove, you set the bread aside and you put a towel over the top of it and you put it in a warm and humid place and, and it needs time to expand. The cost of forcing a conversation into time is called rework. What happens is you come back at some point in the future and people deliver what you thought you agreed on. And what people realize is, no, that's not what I meant. Well, you didn't get time to explain what you meant because we we're in a rush to get it into 50 minutes. So everyone went out and did something and wasted a huge amount of effort resources, both financial and human, customer time, supply time. Yet if we would have just paused just a little longer and gone, okay, well, let's make this part two or part three because we fully haven't explored X, Y, Z. Then the rework is less then people bring back a work product that's of a quality and a timeliness that means it can be shared. But the consequence of rushing into time is just a rework. Planning, foresight, flexibility, <laughs> lots of different things. My goodness. Well, Oscar, um, too many things to listen to. Whoa. Well, I can certainly, and I would like to voraciously encourage anyone listening who has listened all the way through to the very end, good on you, to go and get your book. Uh, not only would I encourage them to buy your book, I would also encourage, because I need both, I, this is what I did, uh, to buy the book, which I can hold up here, and to listen to the audible and the reason for the listen outside of the fact that we're listening to listening is the way that you did the audiobook is delightful it's full of personality it's got all the different interviews that are injected into it when i first did an audible i wasn't allowed to have a, a tummy digestion i wasn't allowed to have a comma in the wrong place you, sir, went fully off script as far as I was concerned. <laughs> and you made it a wonderfully good experience. And yet there are so many things I wanted to pick up and catch and note. So that's why I had to have the book. So that's what I'm going to say. How can anybody follow you? Oscar, what's the best way to connect with you? And of course, what's the best way to go grab your book? I'll get the book from awkward book retailers. Um, as much as I'd love you to connect with me, I'd rather you connect with yourself. Visit listeningquiz.com. Go and take the seven-minute assessment. Understand what the barriers to listening are. And from there, you'll get all the coordinates to connect to me if you want to. But I would encourage you to learn about what your primary and secondary listening barriers are. And that'll be more useful to your listening than maybe connecting with me in the first instance, listeningquiz.com. That's the very first time I've ever had somebody go listen to yourself. Oscar, a true pleasure and a privilege to have you on. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening.